Hi, I'd like to preface this video with a few pieces of information. First of all, this video was filmed in May 2021, one day after Israel and Hamas agreed to a ceasefire after an 11-day conflict in Gaza that claimed hundreds of lives. Second, Lebanon is home to over 1.5 million refugees, which is a massive number, knowing that Lebanon is home to about 6 to 7 million people. Today, the majority are Syrian, but there are also a lot of Palestinians. Many came during the 1948 Palestinian exodus, and since then, the number grew with the new generations. Now, today we wanted to pay a visit to the Shatila refugee camp, one of the largest Palestinian camps in Lebanon. The neighborhood is largely considered dangerous and holds a bad reputation. It has a dark and bloody history, and even today, the Lebanese authorities can't intervene in the camp, and shootings sometimes occur. Now, I've been there before in 2020 with my friend Rob and our photojournalist friend Joao. You might recognize him, he's been on the channel before. We were there documenting life in the neighborhood, and I did feel a bit tense. Some people were suspicious of us, like, why were we there? But we met friendly people, and we were always open about our intentions, so it was a positive experience, and that's why I felt comfortable going back today. Plus, this time we had a point of contact who would very kindly show us around. Now, the topic of Palestinians in Lebanon is very complex and it goes back decades. I've read a lot about it, but I don't believe that I'm in a position to understand it fully or explain it. So I simply wanted to observe and hear people's stories, ask questions, and document my time in Shatila. It was a really, really interesting place. Please watch with an open mind and enjoy. Hello everyone, welcome to day 18 of making a new video every single day of May. Today I'm in a refugee camp in the middle of Beirut. I'm gonna start with this morning to give you a bit more context about what's happening. Let's go back. We are going to a Palestinian refugee camp that's called Sabra. Sabra and Chatil actually, there's two different camps that are right next to each other. All my life I've been told to never go over there, it's super dangerous. People have weapons there, they have fights. Obviously it's very exaggerated and mainstream media doesn't help at all either to portray a beautiful image of this place. Let's see today what the Palestinians have to say about everything that's happening right now. We're entering Shatila right now. We parked the car and now we're trying to get to the location that was sent to us. We are meeting up with a guy called Ahmed Hussein who has an NGO and he does a lot of charity work. He helps a lot of people inside the camp. It's a Palestinian NGO. So we're trying to get to his uh, place. We don't really know where it is exactly, but we're trying to figure it out as we go. I'm excited to explore and meet some people and ask questions and learn more about what it's like to live in uh, Shatia as a Palestinian. Sorry. So there's actually two refugee camps in this part of Beirut, in uh, West Beirut. There's Sabra and then there's Shatila. This place is like a maze, really. And everyone seems to know their way. The camps were originally set up in the 50s for Palestinians, but since then there's been a lot of Syrian refugees as well. But right now we're deep inside the camp and this area is exclusively, almost exclusively Palestinians. We have arrived at the first destination, which is the mosque, and we're gonna meet up with uh, Ahmed Hussein. Let's go in. Hello. Hello. We are inside this place. I have no idea what's happening. Ahmed Hussein just invited us for lunch. He does distributions, food distributions every single day. People are here inside the camp, and he's an NGO actually. So. Uh, I always say I'm from Germany because that's where I live and it makes things easier and people have been telling me my daughter lives there, my brother lives there because there are a lot of Palestinians that were able to seek asylum in Germany. I am so overwhelmed with what's happening right now. Yeah, let's continue with Abu Ali now. And he's going to show us around the 
camps and we're gonna walk around and you're gonna tell us a bit more about what it's like to live in Shatila, right? Thank you. This place is a complete maze. It's just so easy to get lost. I don't know how people know their way around. I mean, probably they, because they've been living here for decades. The NGO that uh, San has, has created is able to name all the buildings and number them and make it easier for people to locate people, families in need, create a roadmap of what the camp looks like and where everyone lives and where everything is. Which is really helpful, I think, because I mean, I'm lost already and I have no idea how to get to the car. So they basically gave these buildings addresses. So if you come to this one over here, you'll see. This is G22 and it has four stories. Crazy. So this is G and on the other side it's B. The state of some of these buildings are just really, really poor. I mean, look at that. There's barely, barely any bricks holding up that building. And it's like the corner of the building. So I can't imagine, like, it must be really scary. What if it breaks? What if it falls down? Just look at that. Hello, Habibi. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, let's go. This way? Yeah. We are very lucky to be with Abu Ali. Abu Ali, he knows everyone here in the camp, so he's taking us around and it's very difficult usually to enter these camps for foreigners. So what do you think? What, is, what does this look like to you? It's really weird. It's like a, a weird uh, ocean of concrete and unfinished buildings, but people just adapted. You don't know if you're going to live the next day or not, or what's going to happen with the, with the country or with your financial situation. So you just leave it as it is and you accept your fate. And it's, it's pretty crazy. It's pretty crazy to witness, honestly. Yeah, and the living conditions but, are really poor. I mean, the, the, the buildings are completely unfinished because people don't have the means to build proper houses it's like a couple of bricks there was a building down there like it literally the the whole house is just a little column of bricks it's holding up an entire floor it's really scary there are so many kids there's so much happening here really this lady right here is making coffee but also slushy for little kids and you see them everywhere drinking slushies or eating ice creams running around but you always wonder like what goes on what happens inside and it's just people living life and walking everywhere Hello. Wait, Rob. Yeah. There's no person behind me. No, in this camp. There are people playing pool in there, or billiard. I don't, I'm not sure what it is. But yeah, there's like so much happening. Everyone's living their individual lives. Hi, hello. Hello. What are you guys doing? Swiss one. Uh, I know. Your name? You speak English? Yes. Oh. And you? Yes. What's your name? Cesar. Cesar, and you are? Ibrahim. Ibrahim, nice to meet you. You're playing with marbles, right? Yes. Can, can I film you? Yes. Can I film you? Oops, sorry. Okay, merci. Bye bye. bye. <laughs> Wow, it's so cool. I mean, I used to play marbles when I was a kid as well. Hello, <laughs> Hello. 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 There's so many colorful buildings. This looks like it's a nursery. Music notes, drawings on the wall, painted walls. And right here there is a barber. Just like a little bit town within the whole big city of, uh, of Beirut. Abbas is joining us today. Have you ever been here in Shatila before? No. I no? But so. well, you've lived your whole life in Beirut? Yeah. What does it feel like? First impressions? I, I haven't been to this camp before, but I've been to others. And uh, it's, not, it's just, I don't know how to give you a first impression, but I remember that it was sort of difficult to see. Like, we're living comfortable lives, and at the same time, there's 
people that you know, have very ter terrible housing conditions. So, and we should really work towards that. What did you grow up learning about Shatila, like from an outside perspective? What did you know beforehand, like before yeah, coming so here? What did you think about it? I didn't have much preconceptions, but like right now, just before coming, I told my mom that I was coming here, and she was very scared because there's a lot of stereotypes about what could happen to you here. And, yeah. Mainstream media and brainwashing in Lebanon. And lack of awareness and lack of curiosity as well. Refugee, refugee, oh there's water dripping from somewhere. Refugee camps are not just tents and cardboard that you see in pictures. Refugee camps are also neighborhoods of people actually living here for decades. I mean this camp was created in the 50s so it's great to be here and kind of like putting into question what I know and like my own knowledge because I'm learning so much being here and right here there's just like an abandoned bus. One thing I'm trying to remind myself when I'm wandering around the narrow streets of Shatila is to always look up because there's always something happening up there. Beyond all the cables, people peeking out of their windows to see what's happening, clothes hanging, flags, yeah, always look up. I mean, or just like two seconds ago, I looked up and I found this big key, which is like a key to Palestine. There was like a map of Palestine within the key. It's a key to their land. So always look up. Okay, and now we've just come to a courtyard and there's tons of kids playing football and just playing outside. Wow, look at this. And right next to this courtyard here are the headquarters of the firefighters. Shadi, can you ask him how many members of the firefighters? Uh, yeah. And it's a mix of women. How many men and how many women? 18. 18. the rest of them are guys. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Wow. Eighteen women. Hello. Are you firefighter here? Yeah. And you have a little kid? Yeah. Does she stay with you throughout the day while you're working? Uh, not every time. Oh, okay. Hello. Say hi. Hello. <laughs> She's so cute. Is, it, is there a lot of fires or a lot of work to do here? At night sometimes. At night? Can you look now? So they don't just work in this department here, they work in Lebanon. They help everywhere in Lebanon. Wow, that's amazing. And where do they get the funding from? There's like different organizations and everything that help. Wow, very good. We're going upstairs now. They're going to show us how they treat people when they have like severe burns and wounds. This is like their medical center stuff. <laughs> Infirmary? I'm here. <laughs> <here. laughs> Amazing work, very admirable work. And they actually don't charge any fees as well, they do everything for free. What's this here? Just storage? No, this is where some of them sleep. Oh, okay. Like they have to be on duty and then. Uh... Yeah. I mean, now it makes sense that there's a courtyard because they probably have vehicles coming in. Like if there's an ambulance or something, they need to be able to come to, the, to, to this place and treat them. That's why they keep all the ladders ready to go. To this day, this place remains one of the neighborhoods in Beirut with the lowest living conditions. Hygienic and just in general, like there's not much electricity, water supply is limited, there's no garbage disposal system here, sewage system probably either. It's just deplorable conditions and people have to live in these conditions. You know, lots of kids running around. Uh, babies being born. I saw a newborn that was probably just a couple days old. And it's just really sad to see that they're gonna grow up in this, in this place. I wonder what it's gonna be like over the next couple of decades and then generations. If anything's gonna change or if it's just gonna con continuously like stay in the state of yeah, deplorable living conditions. Hello! <laughs> We're now on one of the main streets of the camp and everyone of course wants a picture and we have to stop every five seconds. Shadi's the photographer today so he's taking lots of pictures of everyone. One, two, three. Yalla, let's 
find the others. Make sure we don't get lost from the game. I know, I know, don't worry. Adam is easy to spot. He's tall, so. <laughs> oh, wow. There's like a memorial for the massacre that happened. Sabra and Shatila massacre. Look at that. You were saying something right now about the living conditions versus the living standards. Like, yes, so we saying? often mistake uh, quality of life with standard of living. So clearly walking around this refugee camp, standard of living is very low. You cannot deny that. But quality of life, the way people interact and, you know, happiness versus like being depressed, you know, I cannot speak for them, but just in my few hours here, it seems like, especially to be a kid, they were so happy they were playing games no one had an ipad and there's such a sense of community here and it really makes you wonder you know how little you need how little you need from a uh, 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 possession standpoint how much more important community is than than money or possessions it's it's also like you can see the sense of community and you can see the kids that are having fun and, and having occupation but also we can't deny the fact that those palestinians they don't have any rights uh, to Growing do normal up. things that yeah. lebanese people do they can't uh, be employed by uh, any type of Lebanese company. Two thirds are below poverty line. There's so many things like that, like so many facts that are really, really like, yeah. when you think about it, you're like, wow, like the future of those people, not yeah, easy at all. Yeah, it's like imagine being 15, 25. It's like, what do you, where, where, where do you aspire There's to? There's no future. What do you aspire to? They're doomed to remain here. And they don't have any passports to travel anywhere. They're constantly in a stateless refugee status, kind of, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Back at the car, Mahmoud. Yes. Thank you so much for showing us around You're today. Welcome. Really, it was so insightful, so informative. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> it was so insightful, and we learned a lot. So thank you so much. You really, it wouldn't have been the same if you hadn't shown us around. If we just walked by ourselves, we wouldn't have learned nearly as much as we did today.